Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Time Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems. The ones that you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve well rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. Before we go any further, I just want to have a little bit of a chat with you listeners. I want to start out by thanking the people that are supporting Sleepy Time Tales on Patreon. There are a few people who are contributing a a few dollars a month to help me cover the costs of the show. And their work and their help is much appreciated. If you listen to the show and you find that it's helping you get restful nights regularly or helping someone you know or care about, I'd like to I'd like you to consider if you have the means available to you and if you want to to support me on Patreon as well. You can go to patreon.com slash sleepy time tales and check out what's on offer there. I'm not gonna go into too many of the details and what's available, but there are benefits for everyone even if you can only sign on for a dollar a month. Up until the end of December I'm running a short term sort of uh, promo as well. Sending new $5 patrons a handwritten postcard. You'll get something in the mail from South Africa, something fun and touristy. Um, I sent some out a few months ago and I think people quite enjoyed what they've got. And as well as that, I'm also going to do a... If I reach $50 by the end of December, I'm going to do a bonus video episode. The video I'll release exclusively to all patrons, but the audio will be released as a bonus episode, um, probably in January, if I end up doing that. We're getting halfway through the month now, and I would like to hit that target. So if you can, if you would like to, and if you find CP Time Tales helpful to you, then please go and check out patreon.com slash CP Time Tales and sign up. If, however, you don't have any money available to contribute directly, there are other ways you can help out as well. You can sign up on my Audible trial at audibletrial.com slash sleepytime to get a free audiobook to keep as well as a 30-day free trial of the Audible service. And um, give me a little kickback there, which will be much appreciated. If you do sign up there, please let me know. Uh, Pop me a mail on contact at sleepytimetales.net or tag me on social media. I'd like to give you a shout out on the show as well. Also something I probably should mention as well is there's other ways to help besides finances as well. So if you're finding the show helpful to you, tell your friends about it. Explain to them about this really weird idea for a podcast that you just listen to and then fall asleep to some strange dude droning in your ears that it's working for you. Let them let them know, spread the word, and um, help me to help more people out there. At the moment as well, I'm re- releasing uh, bonus episodes to all patrons as well as on Radio Public, which you can listen to on the app on iOS or Android. But I'm going to stop releasing those on Radio Public at the end of December. I'm going to leave the old archives up that are there, but they will be exclusive to patrons from the 1st of January, all the new episodes. And um, before we finish up this little rattling the can at you, the music in this episode is uh, Un Desert by Kumiko. Their music is available on the Free Music Archive. And I've also linked their website and their Patreon in the show notes, as they've got some very cool stuff that they release under various names, and I do recommend people check out. Thank you, and let's get back to the show. So what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales? What is it for? This does seem a bit of a strange idea, doesn't it? Listening to a podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to? But lack lack of sleep is a health crisis in the 21st century, 
And this is a show that is intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night with your mind spinning and your emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find that you just can't get back to sleep at 3 a.m.? I'm here to help. My name is Dave, and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. I'm someone who has always struggled to sleep. When I was a baby, I was giving my parents sleepless nights, and those lasted for them for years. And even once I got old enough not to bother them anymore, sleep was always a struggle for me. Until one day I discovered when I was listening to podcasts in bed at night that uh, droning male voices have a tendency to act something like a tranquilizer for me. I was listening to podcasts and I'd find myself waking up when they were finished and having missed everything that I was trying to listen to. I even discovered that there are podcasts out there specifically aimed at helping people to sleep. And considering that I have a droning male voice, I thought I'd do my part to see if I can reach out and help other people to get a good night's sleep. Now, every episode starts with this long, boring, droning intro. And um, it's there for a reason. It's something not everybody enjoys, but it does have a purpose. The primary thing for the intro is I need to explain to new listeners what the whole idea is of Sleepy Time Tales and what it's for, and sort of explain the structure to people. And part of the things that we're trying to do here with Sleepy Time Tales is to create new habits. So for people who've been listening for a while, one of the things I want to do is get people into the habit of taking this intro as the time, as part of the process of trying to get to sleep. Um... Now is the time for you to brush your teeth and turn the lights out and get your room into a comfortable temperature. Prepare the space and prepare yourself for a good night's sleep. Because ultimately what we're trying to do here is build a space together. A nest or a cave or a little little, little cabin in the woods, something to for you to be comfortable to sleep in. There's a couple of, I think, a couple of different ways you can engage with the show. For me, when I listen to a, a podcast that as I'm trying to sleep to, one thing I need to do is I actually need a story to focus my attention on. I need something that keeps my mind focused on a single point to stop it from spinning out into stress and anxiety. I need to focus just enough not to resist sleep when it comes creeping up on me. For some people may need a slightly different way to approach it. Maybe for you, you need something almost like white noise, um, an equivalent of rain or the sound of waves, a droning baritone running on in the background. Usually my stories are something fairly original. I've got little stories that I've been working on, serial things that pretty much still stand on their own. But because I work in the hospitality business and this time of year is extremely busy for me, I not really have the time to do the preparation that those shows require. So what I'm doing for the holiday season is I'm going to be doing mostly cold readings of various stories and books that I've dug up, dug up old historical stories, because I don't want to leave the listeners hanging, but I don't have the time to put it in with the original stories, and I don't want to be sloppy with those, so it's a sort of compromised thing. But I am interested, I did get some positive feedback on one of my story nights that I did, and so I'm interested to hear if this is working for you, if it's maybe something I should do a little bit more often. Uh, so please send me some feedback at contact at sleepytimetales.net, or on the various social media, just to let me know how this works for you. But whether it's an original story or something I'm reading, the main thing is that you as the listener need to do is you can't force it. Just keep a light mental grip on the on the story, just so that you can allow the need for sleep to come creeping up on you. 
Now, I'm hoping that you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode, but it's very important that you don't feel pressurized. If this is your first night, it may not work for you. I recommend giving it two or three nights to see if you can get used to the sound of my voice and my accent or just even getting over the whole idea of this being a bit of a strange thing. Some people who have been with me for a while, one episode isn't long enough. They queue up a few and let them play. What's very important though is that you just try to relax. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights lying staring at the ceiling, this may take some time to work for you. So queue up an episode, so queue up a few episodes or just let it run through the backlog. What I do with the podcast I listen to is I just let them stream all night. I lie down in the dark with my earbuds in and let them go. Sometimes when I get that 3 a.m. wake up that uh, is unfortunately becoming a bit too common, the stream is still running and I just let those voices waft me back to sleep. Sometimes I wake up 30 minutes before my alarm goes. That used to be something that used to really upset me, but these days I just carry on listening and sometimes I fall back asleep again. I've got to tell you, when that works out, that 30 minutes is sometimes the best part of my night. Just allowing myself to relax completely right before the alarm is deeply, deeply satisfying. And so you have the basic idea. You relax and you lie in the dark, and while you do that, I'll tell you a tale. So relax, dear listener. My nighttime friend who has elected to lie in the dark, listening to my voice. You will always be safe with me. I'm here to help you to relax. To do a small part to improve your life in a big way. People don't sleep very well these days and it it makes life harder. So I'm here to do my little part to help you. To help you to face tomorrow and the day after, well rested and better able to cope. One of my central things with this show and it's something I struggle with in my personal life I have to be honest I'm a bit of a sarcastic person but this show is a safe space it's a kind space I very I believe very strongly in the importance of kindness especially when you're mentally frazzled and tired and need to sleep I want to be kind to you I need to share kindness with you and it's all in vain if you can't just be kind to yourself So don't beat yourself up and don't rebuke yourself if you can't sleep. Don't get tense if you just can't get over the edge, even with me here trying to help. Frustration is one of the great enemies of a good night's sleep. And the intention with this podcast is to short-circuit that frustration. To distract the feeling we get when we blame ourselves for not being able to let go and just drift into the dark. So take a breath. Forgive the fact that you can't sleep and let my voice wash over you. Take another breath. Imagine the warm darkness, sleep inviting you into a better life starting tomorrow. And if you can't let go, just forgive yourself and try again tomorrow. If you've had a life of insomnia, sleep is something like an enemy. But it is not your enemy. It's a natural part of life that we have been pulled away from by stress of life and what we call progress that shines bright blue lights in our eyes at all hours. So I'm here to work with you, to create a safe space, a cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, I'll chat again soon. And of course you aren't hearing me. Except maybe in a dream. Sailing Alone Around the World by Captain Joshua Slocum To the one who said, the spray will come back. Chapter 1 A blue nose ancestry with Yankee proclivities, youthful fondness for the sea, master of the ship Northern Light, lost of the aquid neck, return home from Brazil in the canoe Liberdade. 
the gift of a ship, the rebuilding of the spray, conundrums in regard to finance and caulking, the launching of the spray. In the fair land of Nova Scotia, a maritime province, there is a ridge called North Mountain, overlooking the Bay of Fundy on one side and the fertile Annapolis Valley on the other. On the northern slope of the range grows the hardy spruce tree, well adapted for ship timbers, of which many vessels of all classes have been built. The people of this coast, hardy, robust and strong, are disposed to compete in the world's commerce, and it is nothing against the master mariner if the birthplace mentioned on his certificate be Nova Scotia. I was born in a cold spot, on coldest northern mountain, on a cold February 20th. Though I am a citizen of the United States, a naturalized Yankee if it may be said that Nova Scotians are not Yankees in the truest sense of the word. On both sides my family were sailors, and if any slocum can be found not seafaring, he will show at least an inclination to whittle models of boats and contemplate voyages. My father was the sort of man who, if wrecked on a desolate island, would find his way home, if he had a jackknife and could find a tree. He was a good judge of a boat, but the old clay farm which some calamity had made his was an anchor to him. He was not afraid of a capful of wind, and he never took a back seat at camp meeting or good old-fashioned revival. As for myself, the wonderful sea charmed me from the first. At the age of eight I had already been afloat along with the other boys on the bay, with chances greatly in favour of being drowned, when a lad I fooled with important post of cook on a fishing schooner, but I was not long in the galley for the crew mutinied at the appearance of my first duff and chucked me out before I had a chance to shine as a culinary artist. The next step towards the goal of happiness found me before the mast in a full rigged ship bound on a foreign voyage. Thus I came over the bows and not in through the cabin windows to the command of a ship. My best command was that of the magnificent ship Northern Light, of which I was a part owner. I had a right to be proud of her, for at that time, in the 80s, she was the finest American sailing vessel afloat. Afterward I owned and sailed the Aquid Neck, a little bark which of all man's handiwork seemed to me the nearest to perfection of beauty and which in speed, when the wind blew, asked no favours of steamers. I had been nearly twenty years a shipmaster when I quit her deck on the coast of Brazil, where she was wrecked. My home voyage to New York with my family was made in the canoe Libertad, without accident. My voyages were all foreign. I sailed as freighter and trader principally to China, Japan, Australia, and among the Spice Islands. Mine was not the sort of life to make one long to coil up one's rope on land, the customs and ways of which I had finally almost forgotten. And so when times for freighters got bad, as at last they did, and I tried to quit the sea, what was there for an old sailor to do? I was born in the breezes and I had studied the sea as perhaps few men have studied it, neglecting all else. Next in attractiveness after seafaring came shipbuilding. I longed to be master in both professions, and in a small way in time I accomplished my desire. From the decks of start ships in the worst gales I had made calculations as to the size and sorts of a ship safest for all weathers and seas. Thus the voyage which I am now to narrate was a natural outcome not only of my love of adventure, but of my lifelong experience. One midwinter day of 1892, in Boston, where I had been cast up from old ocean, so to speak, a year or two before, I was cogitating whether I should apply for a command, and again eat my bread and butter on the sea, or go to work at the shipyard, when I met an old acquaintance, a whaling captain, who said, come to Fairhaven and I'll give you a ship, but, he added, she wants some repairs. The captain's terms, when fully explained, were more than satisfactory to me. They included all the assistance I would require to fit the craft for sea. I was only too glad to accept for I finally found that I could not obtain work in a shipyard without first paying $50 to a society, and as for a ship to command, there were not enough ships to go around. Nearly all atoll vessels had been cut down for coal barges, and were being ignominiously towed by the nose from port to port, while many worthy captains addressed themselves to sailors' snug harbour. The next day I landed at Fairhaven, opposite New Bedford, and found that my friend had something of a joke on me. For seven years the joke had been on him. 
The ship proved to be a very antiquated sloop called the Spray, which the neighbors declared had been built in the year one. She was affectionately propped up in a field some distance from salt water and was covered with canvas. The people of Fairhaven are hardly need say are thrifty and observant. For seven years they had asked, I wonder what Captain Eben Pierce is going to do with the old spray. The day I appeared there was a buzz at the gossip exchange. At last someone had come and was actually at work on the old spray. Breaking her up, I suppose. No, going to rebuild her. Great was the amazement. Will it pay was the question which for a year or more I answered by declaring that I would make it pay. My axe fell the stout oak tree nearby for a keel, and farmer Howard for a small sum of money, hauled in this and other timbers for the frame of the new vessel. I rigged a steam box and a pot for a boiler, the timbers for ribs being straight saplings were dressed and steamed till supple and then bent over a log, where they were secured till set. Something tangible appeared every day to show for my labour, and the neighbours made the work sociable. It was a great day in the spray shipyard when her new stem was set up and fastened to the near keel. Whaling captains came from far to survey it. With one voice they pronounced it A1, and in their opinion, fit to smash ice. The oldest captain shook my hand warmly when the breast hooks were put in, declaring that he could see no reason why the spray should not cut in bowhead, yet off the coast of Greenland. The much-esteemed stem piece was from the butt of the smartest kind of pasture oak. It afterwards split a coral patch in two at the Keeling Islands and did not receive a blemish. Better timber for a ship than pasture white oak never grew. The breast hooks, as well as all the ribs, were of this wood, and were steamed and bent into shape as required. It was hard upon March when I began work in earnest. The weather was cold. Still, there were plenty of inspectors to back me with advice. When a whaling captain hove in sight, I just rested my ads while a while and gammed with him. New Bedford, the home of the whaling captains, is connected with Fairhaven by a bridge, and the walking is good. They never worked along up to the shipyard too often for me. It was the charming tales about Arctic whaling that inspired me to put a double set of breast hooks in the spray that she might shunt us. The seasons came quickly while I worked. Hardly were the ribs of the sloop up before apple trees were in bloom. Then the daisies and cherries came soon after. Close by the place where the old spray had now dissolved, rested the ashes of John Cook, a revered pilgrim father. So the new spray rose from hallowed ground. From the deck of the new craft I could put out my hand and pick cherries that grew over the little grave. The planks from the new vessel, which I soon came to put on, were of Georgia pine. The operation of putting them on was tedious, but when on the caulking was easy. The outward edges stood slightly open to receive the caulking, but the inner edges were so close that I could not see daylight between them. All the butts were fastened by through bolts with screw nuts tightening them to the timbers, so that there would be no complaint from them. Many bolts with screw nuts were used in other parts of the construction, in all about a thousand. It was my purpose to make my vessel start and strong. Now it is a law in Lloyd's that the Jane repaired all out of the old units until she is entirely new is still the Jane. The spray changed her being so gradually that it was hard to say at which point the old died or the new took birth, and it was no matter. The bulwarks are built up of white oak stanchions fourteen inches high and covered with seven eighth inch white pine. These stanchions mortised through a two inch covering board are caulked with thin cedar wedges. They have remained perfectly tight ever since. The deck are made of one and a half inch by three inch white pine spiked to beams, six by six inches of yellow or Georgia pine, placed three feet apart. The deck enclosures were one over the aperture of the main hatch, six feet by six for a cooking galley and a trunk further aft, about ten feet by twelve for a cabin. Both of these rose about three feet above the deck and were sunk sufficiently into the hole to afford headroom. In the spaces along the sides of the cabin, under the deck, I arranged a berth to sleep in and shelves for small storage, not forgetting a place for the medicine chest. In the midship hold, that is, the space between cabin and galley, under the deck, was room for provision of water, salt beef, etc., ample for many months. 
The whole of my vessel being now put together as strongly as wood and iron could make her, and the various rooms partitioned off, I set about caulking ship. Grave fears were entertained by some at this point I should fail. I myself gave some thought to the advisability of a professional caulker. The very first blow I struck on the cotton with the caulking iron, which I thought was right, many others thought wrong. It'll crawl, cried a man from Marion, passing with a basket of clams on his back. It'll crawl, cried another from West Island when he saw me driving cotton into the seams. Bruno simply wagged his tail. Even Mr. Ben J, a noted authority on weighing ships, whose mind, however, was said to totter, asked rather confidently if I did not think it would crawl. How fast will it crawl, cried my old captain friend, who had been towed by many a lively sperm whale. Tell us how fast, cried he, and we may get it into port on time. However, I drove a thread of oakum on top of the cotton, as from the first I had intended to do, and Bruno again wagged his tail. The cotton never crawled. When the caulking was finished, two coats of copper paint were slapped on the bottom, two of white lead on the top sides and bulwarks. The rudder was then shipped and painted, and on the following day the spray was launched. As she rode at her ancient rust-eaten anchor, she sat on the water like a swan. The spray's dimensions were, when finished, 36 feet 9 inches long. Overall, 14 feet 2 inches wide and 4 feet 2 inches deep in the hold, her tonnage being 9 tons net and 12 and 71 hundredths tons gross. Then the mast, a smart New Hampshire spruce, was fitted, and likewise all the small appurtenances necessary for a short cruise. Sails were bent and away she flew with my friend, Captain Pierce and me, across Buzzards Bay on a trial trip. All right. The only thing that now worried my friends along the beach was, will she pay? The cost of my new vessel was $553.62 for materials and 13 months of my own labor. I was several months more than that at Fairhaven for I got to work now and then on occasional whale ship fitting further down the harbor. And that kept me over time. Chapter 2 On Failure as a Fisherman A Voyage Around the World Projected From Boston to Gloucester Fitting out for the ocean voyage Half of a dory for a ship's boat The run from Gloucester to Nova Scotia A Shaking up in home waters Among old friends I spent a season in my new craft fishing on the coast only to find that I had not the cunning properly to bait a hook, but at last the time arrived to weigh anchor and get to sea in earnest. I had resolved on a voyage around the world, and as the wind was blowing on the morning of April 24th, 1895, was fair. At noon I weighed anchor, set sail, and pulled away from Boston, where the spray had been moored snugly all winter. The twelve o'clock whistles were blowing just as the sloop shot ahead under full sail. A short board was made up at the harbour of the port tack, and coming about she stood seaward with her boom well off to port, and swung past the ferries with lively heels. A photographer on the outer pier at East Boston got a picture of her as she swept by, her flag at the peak throwing its folds clear. A thrilling pulse beat high in me. My step was light on deck in the crisp air. I felt that there could be no turning back, and that I was engaging in an adventure the meaning of which I thoroughly understood. I had taken little advice from anyone, for I had a right to my own opinions in matters pertaining to the sea. That the best of sailors might do worse than even I alone was borne in upon me not a league from Boston docks, where a great steamship, fully manned, officered, and piloted, lay stranded and broken. This was the Venetian. She was broken completely in two over a ledge. So in the first hour of my lone journey I had proof that the spray could at least do better than this fully handed steamship, for I was already further on my voyage than she. Take warning spray and have a care, I uttered aloud to my bark, passing fairy like silently down the bay. The wind freshened and the spray rounded the island at the rate of seven knots. Passing it she squared away direct for Gloucester to procure there some fishermen's doors. Waves dancing joyously across Massachusetts Bay met her coming out of harbour to dash them into myriads of sparkling gems that hung about her at every surge. The day was perfect, the sunlight clear and strong. Every particle of water thrown into the air became a gem, and the spray, bounding ahead, snatched necklace after necklace from the sea, 
and as often threw them away. We have all seen miniature rainbows about a ship's prow, but the spray flung out a bow of her own that day, such as I had never seen before. Her good angel had embarked on the voyage, serrated in the sea. Old Nahant was soon abeam, then Marblehead was put astern. Other vessels were outward bound, but none of them passed the spray flying along her course. I heard the clanking of the dismal bell on Norman's woe as we went by, and the reef where the schooner Hesperus struck are passed close aboard. The bones of a wreck tossed up lay bleaching on the shore abreast, the wind still freshening. I settled the throat of the mainsail to ease the sloop's helm, for I could hardly hold her before it with the whole mainsail set. A schooner ahead of me lowered all sail and ran into port under bare poles, the wind being fair. As the spray brushed by the stranger, I saw that some of his sails were gone, and much canvas hung in his rigging, from the effects of the squall. I made for the cove, a lovely branch of Gloucester's fine harbour, again to look into the spray over, and to weigh the voyage and my feelings and all that. The bay was feather white as my little vessel tore in, smothered in foam. It was my first experience of coming into port alone, with a craft of any size, and in and, and among shipping. Old fishermen ran down to the wharf for which the spray was heading, apparently intent on braining herself there. I hardly knew how calamity was averted, but with my heart in my mouth, almost, I let go the wheel, stepped quickly forward and down the jib. The sloop naturally rounded in the wind, and just ranging ahead, laid her cheek against a mooring pile at the windward corner of the wharf. So quietly, after all, that you would not have broken an egg. Very leisurely I passed a rope around the post and she was moored. Then a cheer went up from the little crowd on the wharf. You couldn't have done it better, cried an old skipper, if you weighed a ton. Now, my weight was rather less than the fifteenth part of a ton, but I said nothing. Only putting on a look of careless indifference to say for me, oh, that's nothing. For some of the ablest sailors in the world were looking at me and my wish was not to appear green for I had a mind to stay in Gloucester several days. Had I uttered a word, it surely would have betrayed me, for I was still quite nervous and short of breath. I remained in Gloucester about two weeks, fitting out with the various articles for the voyage, most readily obtained there. The owners of the wharf where I lay and of many fishing fishing, the owners of the wharf where I lay and of many fishing vessels, put on board dry cod galore, also a barrel of oil to calm the waves. They were old skippers themselves and took a great interest in the voyage. They also made the spray a present of a fisherman's own lantern, which I found would throw a light a great distance round. Indeed, a ship that would run another down having such a good light aboard would be capable of running into a light ship. A gaff, a pew, and a dip net, all of which an old fisherman declared that I could not sail without, were all put aboard. Then from across the cove came a case of copper paint, a famous anti-fouling article which took me in good stead long after. I slapped two coats of this paint on the bottom of the spray while she lay a tide or so on the hard beach. For a boat to take along, I made shift to cut a castaway dory in two athwartships, boarding up the end where it was cut. This half dory I could hoist in and out by the nose easily enough by hooking through the throat halyards into a strop fitted for the purpose. A whole dory would be heavy and awkward to handle alone. Manifestly, there was not room on deck for more than half a boat, which, after all, was better than no boat at all, and was large enough for one man. I perceived, moreover, that the newly arranged craft would answer for a washing machine when placed at warships, and also for a bathtub. Indeed, for the former office, my raised... Dory gained such a reputation on the voyage that my washerwoman at Samoa would not take no for an answer. She could see with one eye that it was a new invention that could beat any Yankee notion ever brought by missionaries to the islands, and she had to have it. The want of a chronometer for the voyage was all that now worried me. In our newfangled notions of navigation, it is supposed that a mariner cannot find his way without one, and I had myself drifted into this way of thinking. My old chronometer, a good one, had been long in disuse. It would cost $15 to clean and rate it. 
For sufficient reasons, I left that timepiece at home, where the Dutchman left his anchor. I had the great lantern, and a lady in Boston sent me the price of a large two-burner cabin lamp, which lighted the cabin at night, and by some small contriving served for a stove through the day. Being thus refitted, I am once more ready for sea, and on May 7 again made sail. With little room in which to turn the spray and gathering headway, scratched the paint off an old fine weather craft in the fairway, being puttied and painted for a summer voyage. Who will pay for that? growled the painters. I will, said I, with the main sheet, and echoed the captain of the bluebird close by, which was his way of saying that I was off. There was nothing to pay for above five cents worth of paint, maybe, but such a din was raised between the old hooker and the bluebird which now took my case, that the first cause of it was forgotten altogether. Anyhow, Noble was sent after me. The weather was mild on the day of my departure from Gloucester, and the point ahead as the spray stood out of the cove was a lively picture, for the front of a tall factory was a flitter of handkerchiefs and caps. Pretty faces peered out of the windows from top to bottom of the building, all smiling bon voyage. Some held me to know where away and why alone. Why? When I made as if to stand in, a hundred pairs of arms reached out and said, Come, but the shore was dangerous. The sloop worked out of the way against a light southwest wind and about noon squared away at Eastern Point, receiving at the same time a hearty salute. The last of many kindnesses to her Gloucester. The wind freshened off the point and skipped along smoothly. The spray was soon off to Thatcher's Island Lights. Thence shaping her course east by compass to go north of Cash's Ledge and the Amon Rocks. I sat and considered the matter all over again and asked myself once more whether it was best to sail around the edge, rocks and all. I had only said that I would sail around the world in the spray, dangers of the sea excepted, but I must have said it very much in earnest. The charter party with myself seemed to bind me and so I sailed on. Toward night I hauled the sloop to the wind and baiting a hook sounded for bottom fish in thirty fathoms on the edge of Cash's ledge. With fair success I hauled till dark, landing on deck three cod and two haddock, one hake, and best of all, a small halibut, all plump, plump and spry. This I thought would be the place to take a good stock of provisions above what I already had, so I put out a sea anchor that would hold her head to windward. The current being southwest against the wind, I felt quite sure would find the spray still on the bank or near it in the morning. Then, straddling the cable and putting my great lantern in the rigging, I lay down for the first time at sea alone, not to sleep, but to doze and dream. I had read somewhere of a fishing schooner hooking her anchor into a whale and being towed a long way in a great speed. This was exactly what happened to the spray, in my dream. I could not shake it off entirely when I woke, and I found that the wind blowing and the heavy sea now running had disturbed my short rest. A scud was flying across the moon. A storm was brewing. Indeed, it was already stormy. I reefed the sails and hauled in my sea anchor, and setting what canvas the sloop could carry, headed her away for Monaghan Light, which she made before daylight on the morning of the 8th. The wind being free, I ran into Port Pond Harbour, which is a little port east from Pemaquid. There I rested a day while the wind rattled among the pine trees on shore, but the following day was fine enough and I put to sea, first writing up my log from Cape Ann, not omitting a full account of my adventure with the whale. Stretched along a coast among many islands and over a tranquil sea, at evening of this day, May 10th, she came up with a considerable island, which I shall always think of the island of frogs, for the spray was charmed by a million voices. From the island of frogs we made for the island of birds, called Gannet Island, and sometimes Gannet Rock, whereon is a bright intermittent light which flashed fitfully across the spray's deck as she coasted along under its light and shade, then shaping a course for Briar's Island. I came among vessels the following afternoon on the western fishing grounds, and after speaking a fisherman at anchor who gave me a wrong course, the spray sailed directly over the southwest ledge through the worst tide race in the Bay of Fundy and out into Westport Harbour in Nova Scotia, where I had spent eight years of my life as a lad. The fisherman may have said east-southeast, the course I was steering when I hailed him, but I thought he said east-northeast, and I accordingly changed it to that. Before he made up his mind to answer me at all, he improved the occasion of his own curiosity to know where I was from, and if I was alone, and if I didn't have no dog nor cat. 
It was the first time in all my life at sea that I had heard a hail for information answered by a question. I think the chap belonged to the foreign islands. There was one thing I was sure of, and that was that he did not belong to Briar's Island, because he dodged a sea that slopped over the rail and stopped to brush the water from his face. He lost the fine cod which he was about to ship. My islander would not have done that. It is known that Briar Island... It is known that a Briar Islander, fish or no fish on his hook, never flinches from a sea. He just tends to his lines and hauls or saws. Nay, have I not seen my old friend Deacon W. D., a good man of the island, while listening to a sermon in the little church of the hill, reach out his hand over the door of his pew and jig imaginary squid in the aisle, to the intense delight of the young people who did not realize that to catch good fish, one must have good bait, the thing most on the deacon's mind. I was delighted to reach Westport. Any port at all would have been delightful after the terrible thrashing I got in the fierce southwest rip, and to find myself among old schoolmates now was charming. It was the 13th of the month, and 13 is my lucky number, a fact registered long before Dr. Nansen sailed in search of the North Pole with his crew of 13. Perhaps he had heard of my success in taking a most extraordinary ship successfully to Brazil with that number of crew. The very stones on Briar's Island I was glad to see again, and I knew them all. The little shop round the corner, which for 35 years I had not seen, was the same, except that it looked a deal smaller. It wore the same shingles, I was sure of it, for I did not know the roof where we boys, night after night, hunted for the skin of a black cat, to be taken on a dark night to make a plaster for a poor lame man. Lurie the tailor lived there when boys were boys. In his day he was fond of the gun. He always carried his powder loose in the tail pocket of his coat. He usually had his mouth in a short dadeen, but in an evil moment he put the dadeen, lighted, in the pocket among the powder. Mr. Lurie was an eccentric man. At Briar's Island, I overhauled the spray once more and tried her seams, but found that even the test of the southwest rip had started nothing. Bad weather and much headwind prevailed outside, and I was in no hurry to round Cape Sable. I made a short excursion with some friends to St. Mary's Bay, an old cruising ground, and back to the island. Then I sailed, putting it to Yarmouth the following day on a account of fog and headwind. I spent some time pleasantly enough in Yarmouth, Took in some butter for the voyage, also a barrel of potatoes. Filled six barrels of water and stowed all under deck. At Yarmouth, too, I got my famous tin clock, the only timepiece I carried on the whole voyage. The price of it was a dollar and a half, but on account of the face being smashed, the merchant let me have it for a dollar. Chapter 3 Goodbye to the American coast. Off Sable Island in a fog. In the open sea. The man in the moon takes an interest in the voyage. The first fits of loneliness. The spray encounters La Vigrisa, a bottle of wine from the Spaniard, a bout of words with the captain of the Java, the steamship Olympia spoken, a rival at the Azores. I now stowed all my goods securely, for the boisterous Atlantic was before me, and I sent the topmast down, knowing that the spray would be wholesomer with it on deck. Then I gave the lanyards a pull and hitched them afresh, and saw that the gammon was secure. Also that the boat was lashed, for even in summer one may meet with bad weather in the crossing. In fact, many weeks of bad weather had prevailed. On July 1st, however, after a rude gale, the wind came out northwest and clear, propitious for a good run. On the following day, the head sea having gone down, I sailed from Yarmouth and let go of my last hold on America. The log of my first day on the Atlantic in the spray reads briefly. 9.30 a.m. Sailed from Yarmouth. 4.30 p.m. past Cape Sable. Distance, three cables from the land. The sloop making eight knots, fresh breeze northwest. Before the sun went down, I was taking my supper of strawberries and tea in the smooth water under the lee of the east coast land, along which the spray was now leisurely skirting. At noon on July 3rd, Ironbound Island was abeam. The spray was again at her best. A large schooner came out of Liverpool, Nova Scotia this morning, steering eastward. The spray put her hull down astern in five hours. At 6.45 p.m. I was close in under Chibukta Headlight near Halifax Harbour. I set my flag and squared away, taking my departure from George's Island before the dark to sail east of Sable Island. There are many beacon lights along the coast. Samro, the Rock of Lamentations, carries a noble light which, however, the liner Atlantic on the night of her terrible disaster did not see. 
I watched light after light sink astern as I sailed into the unbound sea, till Sambro, the last of them, was well below the horizon. The spray was then alone, and sailing on she held her course. July 4th at 6am I put in double reefs, and at 8.30am turned out all reefs. At 9.40pm I raised the sheen only of the lights on the west end of Sable Island, which may also be called the Island of Tragedies. The fog, which till this moment had held off, now lowered over the sea like a pall. I was in a world of fog, shut off from the universe. I did not see any more of the light. By the lead, which I cast often, I found that a little after midnight I was passing the east point of the island, and should soon be clear of dangers of land and shoals. The wind was holding free, though it was from a foggy point south-southwest. It is said that within a few years Sable Island has been reduced from 40 miles in length to 20, and that of three lighthouses built on it since 1880, two have been washed away and the third will soon be engulfed. On the evening of July 5th, the spray, having steered all day over a lumpy sea, took it into her head to go without a helmsman's aid. I had been steering southeast by south, but the wind hauling forward a bit, she dropped into a smooth lane heading southeast, and made about eight knots, her very best work. I crowded on sail to cross the track of the liners without loss of time, and to reach as soon as possible the friendly Gulf Stream. The fog lifting before night, I was afforded a look at the sun just as it was touching the sea. I watched it go down and out of sight. Then I turned my face eastward, and there, apparently, at the very end of the bowsprit, was the smiling full moon rising out of the sea. Neptune himself coming over the bows could not have startled me more. (laughs) Good evening, sir, I cried. I'm glad to see you. Many a long talk since then have I had with the man in the moon. He had my confidence on the voyage. About midnight, the fog shut down again, denser than ever before. One could almost stand on it. It continued so for a number of days, the wind increasing to a gale. The waves rose high, but I had a good ship. Still in the dismal fog, I felt myself drifting into loneliness, an insect on a straw in the midst of the elements. I lashed the helm, and my vessel held her course, and while she sailed, I slept. During these days, a feeling of awe crept over me. My memory worked with startling power. The ominous, the insignificant, the great, the small, the wonderful, the commonplace, all appeared before my mental vision in magical succession. Pages of my history were recalled which had been so long forgotten that they seemed to belong to a previous existence. I heard the voices of all the past laughing, crying, telling telling me what I had heard them tell in many corners of the earth. The loneliness of my state wore off when the gale was high and I found much work to do. When fine weather returned, there came a sense of solitude which I could not shake off. I used my voice often, at first giving some order about the affairs of the ship, for I had been told that from disuse I would lose my speech. At the meridian altitude of the sun I called aloud, eight bells, after the custom of a ship on sea. Again from my cabin I cried out to an imaginary man at the helm, How does she head there? And again, Is she on course? But getting no reply, I was reminded more palpably of my condition. My voice sounded hollow in the empty air, and I dropped the practice. However, it was not long before the thought came to me that when I was a lad I used to sing. Why not try that now, when it would disturb no one? My musical talents had never bred envy in others, but out on the Atlantic, to realize what it meant, you should have heard me sing. You should have seen the porpoises leap when I pitched my voice for the waves and the sea and all that was in it. Old turtles with large eyes poked their heads out of the water as I sang Johnny Boker, and they'll pay Dorby Doyle for his boots and the like. But the porpoises were on the whole vastly more appreciative than the turtles. They jumped a deal higher. One day when I was humming a favorite chant, I think it was Babylon's Fallen, a porpoise jumped higher than the bowsprit. Had the spray been going a little faster, she would have scooped him in. The seabird sailed around rather shy. So thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales, the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. But make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get new episodes whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for tonight is Un Désert Bakumiku. 
check out more of their work on their website and their Patreon, which you will find links in the show notes. Good night and sweet dreams.